What's the word, y'all? The in-season tournament is now in its knockout phase. We get Lakers versus Suns. We get Kings versus Pelicans. Bucks versus Knicks. Pacers versus Celtics. I gotta admit, I've loved every single second of the in-season tournament. Not every single aspect of it. There's still a lot of courts that I don't mess around with, but for the most part, the in-season tournament for me has been a success. I think the NBA is gonna determine whether it's a success or not based on ratings and things like that, and I can't give you the behind the scenes of that because I don't know it, but just from a fan's perspective, perspective the in-season tournament has been dope going into last night the, the last day of the in-season tournament group stage the only two teams we knew that had advanced to the knockout phase was the Lakers and the Pelicans all six of the other spots was up for grabs and it was very confusing to figure it out but it was worth it in my opinion the moment the in-season tournament was announced I was like hey this is a good idea because at the end of the day we just want more people engaged in basketball earlier when, when you have a season of 80 plus games it's going to be hard to to get a casual fan to care about it in November and December. I know plenty of people in my personal life that really start watching NBA every season at All-Star break because in their opinion, that's when the season starts. There is no stakes leading up to that point. And the in-season tournament is a way to add some stakes into it. Now, everybody values things differently, right? I'm sure there are some of y'all that are watching this that didn't enjoy the NCAA tournament. You don't see real stakes involved. And that, that is completely okay. All that matters is that the players, the coaches, and everybody involved on the court see that there are stakes involved. And we saw that last night. Because we had moments like this, where the Bulls are down by 30-plus points in the fourth quarter, and Joe Mazzulla and the Boston Celtics decide to intentionally foul Andre Drummond. And you see Coach Billy D is looking at, at uh, Joe Mazzulla like, yo, What's going on? Joe Mazzula has this face that he always looks confused. He, he know what he's doing. And in this case, he's saying, hey, going into tonight, the Boston Celtics need two different things to happen for them to advance. And one of those things they could control, which is winning by 23 or more points against the Bulls. Now, I want you to see that score and everything. You, you can do the math. It's, it's over 23. But they just wanted to make sure that they got as much wiggle room as they could. Uh, Billy Donovan obviously didn't like that, and uh, he shouldn't he, he shouldn't care, or we shouldn't care that Billy Donovan doesn't like that. They talk, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Drummond does Drummond things. He missed two free throws, and eventually the Boston Celtics won by a gazillion points, and as you saw, they're advancing to the next stage. And everybody has an opinion about this, right? Everybody has an opinion. Is Billy Donovan the right? Is Joe Mazzulla the right? At the end of the day, I've been a guy that's always said, the unwritten rules of not just basketball, but sports in general, majority of them are just bad billy if you don't want this to happen how about we don't be down by a gazillion points now i understand him standing up for his guy and drummond who um he mentioned after that he was embarrassed for drummond yada 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 whatever but at the end of the day these unwritten rules about things that you should or shouldn't do i've always found a little bit weird but it also showed us the true colors of the boston celtics because leading into this game jason tatum jason tatum said this the point differential thing, I'm not the biggest fan of it. Last Friday, where the game was already over and the guys were still trying to score, you know, it's all about respecting the game and respecting your opponent. Then we get to yesterday, when it matters, the point differential matters, Jason Tatum and Joe Mazzulla, I'm like, hey, forget, forget about everything I said. Because even Joe Mazzulla has said the day before that he's not even thinking about the end season tournament. I don't know about that. I saw Jason Tatum in, in a game with six seconds, with six minutes ago when you were about 30, you know? And I'm, again, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm okay with these type of things because it adds another element to the regular season. We saw earlier where, where what Tatum is referring to where teams were up by 10 instead of dribbling the ball out, they tried to make it up by 12 because the point differential means so much. Another example of this was the Knicks getting their wild card spot. They went against the Charlotte Hornets last night and you can see they got this spot because they had the same record as the Magic, the Nets, and the Cavs, but their point differential was 13 above the Cavaliers. This might just be a normal game for Tom Thibodeau, but if you look at the fourth quarter of their game against the Hornets yesterday, at the four minute mark, around the five minute mark, Rozier, Brandon Miller, uh, Hayward, Mark Williams, and Miles Bridges all get subbed out for the reserves. Not on New York side, <laughs> that boy Randall, Bronson, he had a 20-20 game, shout out to uh, Julius Randall. They stayed into the game until the very last, oh, I'm sorry, until the last minute. But they were there because they wanted to secure that they were winning by a ton of points 
and they did. Now, it's not all perfect, right? There are some things that I would personally change about it, and we'll talk about that in a second. But for it to be the first one of hopefully many, I think it went as good as you could have imagined. Like even one of the last games of the day, the nasty televised game on TNT, we saw Warriors versus King. And I think for the Kings to make it, they just had to lose by less than 11 points or win the game outright but the game felt like a playoff atmosphere. Now you could say that's because the Warriors and the Kings have played each other 11 times in the last six months. Look that up, that is that is a true number. They played each other 11 times in the last six months, given their, their playoffs and then early in this season, they played each other a bunch too. Um, maybe it was just that they now have built a rivalry, but also, the Kings went out for it, you know? And, and the NBA is continuing to do different things. Like on the Dallas Mavericks broadcast, they had Dirk. Dirk? He was there? On the Miami Heat broadcast, they had Shaquille O'Neal. So, like, they're just incorporating small things here and there to get, again, the casual fan more involved. And, again, I'm going to remind people, this is just the first year of things. The prize pool, as of right now, is half a million dollars to every player that wins. But if this continues to be successful and they sell it, which is their goal in a year, that prize pool can be more money. Or they might shift the price pool. Every time I film at this time of day, the sun is like rotating. We, we got to get the content off, all right? Um, I've also on the Kenny Beaton podcast said that, hey, if the money is not enough, and I feel like based on what we saw yesterday, the money is enough. But if they determined that the money was enough, there wasn't good enough incentive for the players to care, then we can maybe change it to say like, hey, you win the in-season tournament, guaranteed a playoff spot. Not guaranteed a home court, not guaranteed anything, but at least a, let's say, play in spot. And that gives people the incentive to try every single night. Or you can pick to add a lottery pick. Not the odds to get you the first overall pick, but let's say you get a... Matter of fact, it's probably better I'll show you that. Right now, there are 14 teams that are in the lottery. But under the new thing, if we were to change the prize pool, you make it 15 teams in the lottery, and let's say... Uh, the Boston Celtics end up winning it, right? This is a team that would normally have a 30th pick because they're really good, but now they have the 15th highest odds. And even if we say that the 15th highest odds is a, I don't know, let's say 1% chance, it's still a 1% chance. Oh, no, no, less than 1%. It's a 0.2% chance, which is better than the 0.0% chance that you have if you're the Boston Celtics. Or if you're a team that, I don't know, is already in here. Is I'm looking at it. Every team that made the play in this year, as of right now, projects to be a playoff team. But hypothetically, let's say the Utah Jazz had got found their way into the knockout stage and eventually went on to win the in-season tournament. Now, their 6% chance of winning the first overall pick is now a 7% chance because they have another one on the back end. Again, just spitballing ideas. At the end of the day, the NBA is going to tweak things here and there to figure out what exactly works best. The one thing personally I would change is the amount of teams that go into the group stage. Now, I don't want it to turn into the NBA playoffs where more than half of the teams, more than two thirds of the teams is ha have a chance. But I do like the idea of a knockout stage to the knockout stage. Does that make sense? So here's one idea that we just add an extra team. So it is a 10-man bracket instead of an eight-man bracket where two wild, the top two wild card teams are playing against each other to fight against the one seed. Um, log logistically, I don't know how any of this works because you're adding an extra game to the schedule and whatever. But I, like the NBA loves revenue, don't it? So extra ball is extra ball. You trying to tell me you don't want to see Devin Booker go against, um, uh, did you, did Devin Booker play, play against Anthony Everton and win a go home game? Cavs versus Knicks already the head they thing in the playoffs last year. So like, boom, play that game to go to the next stage. And then we get to where we are today. The other idea is a 12 man bracket, which is probably harder to explain to people because it's almost half of the league. But again, it adds more knockout game. Well, I'm not going to build the diagram, but the 12 games where you'll see that the magic get a knockout game as well and then the rockets are the other team that advance so like i don't know I, the more teams the better until we get to a certain point i think 12 would have to be the max but i think 10 makes a lot of sense too and like a nerdy cool thing about the in-season tournament so far is that tnt and espn are integrating their personalities for the in-season tournament semifinals on thursday so it's gonna have charles barkley kenny the smith shaquille o'neal with stephen a smith and michael wilbon like that is Oh, Ernie Johnson. I skip over your name. My fault, Ernie. You know you're my favorite. Um, that is like insane coverage. These are like some of the best personalities in the game potentially working together. Like th th these are competitors at the end of the day. But the end season turn is bringing us all together. And well, I, I can't say us. I'm not a part of this. But like next year. Come, the NBA, call my phone. You know I'm here for it. Again, I feel like the end season tournament is like a lost none experiment. You know, I don't think anybody lost any interest. I don't think it... Uh, had negative value to the NBA viewing experience for the first time. And I think that at the end of the day, that's a plus. Don't like the courts, but it got people talking. Don't like the jerseys, but it got people talking. And the ball that was played was 
good. But let me know what you think about the NCAA tournament so far. Um, has, has it been a dub or L? Uh, as always, I'll be in the comment section.